So today we're going to continue talking about bivariate transformations, and we're just going to do a whole bunch of examples today. So last time we had left off with the example where we had some u um, that was x plus y and v was x minus y. And what we showed at the end of last time is that I could write the joint PDF of uv as the joint PDF of xy, plugging in u plus v over 2 and u minus v over 2 and multiplying everything by 1 half. And so we can look at a specific example of this. In this case, let's assume that x and y are what we're going to say is iid normal 0, 1. That is, iid here means independent and identically distributed. This means that they are independent of each other, that is, x independent of y, and they have the same identical distribution. x um, is normally distributed, and y also has a standard normal distribution. Now, we know that if x and y are independent, then fxy of x comma y we can factor it as fx of x times fy of y. And in this case, because they're standard normals, they have simple PDFs. PDF of x is 1 over 2 pi e to the negative 1 half x squared. And the PDF of y, which we multiply by, is 1 over 2 pi e to the negative 1 half y squared. So in the example, if we want to now get uv, this joint distribution of uv, if we're going to assume x and y now have a normal distribution, then we just need to plug into our formula. So f u v of u comma v is, well, we can write 1 over root pi times 1 over root pi, uh, 2 pi is just 1 over 2 pi. And then in, for x, we plug in u plus v over 2. So we get e to the negative 1 half times u plus v over 2 squared. And for the y component, we simply get u minus v over 2 squared. So one could stop here if we just wanted the joint distribution. That's technically correct. But let's see if we can figure out what the relationship is, is between u and v. So if we look at um, these two exponents, it's u plus v over 2 squared. Um, so that's 1 fourth u squared plus 2 uv, let's write this as a lowercase v, plus v squared. And if we look at u minus v over 2 quantity squared, we get something similar. u squared plus, whoops, now minus 2 uv plus v squared. And so if we were to add these two things together, what we would get is we get 1 fourth 2 u squared plus 2v squared, or 1 half u squared plus v squared. Why do I want to add these together? Well, if I use my properties of exponents, I can rewrite this as e to a single exponent, where I add together the exponents. And so if we continue this on here, we get f of uv at u comma v, 1 over 2 pi. We can combine these exponents one half, and then we have a one half u squared plus v squared. And this can be factored, and I'm going to factor it in a very particular way. I'm going to write this, whoops, we can't figure out our one half, right? Um, if we go back up, remember we have this one half here. So let's actually remember, we have to multiply everything by one half. And so we get an extra um, one half f front. So I'll just write two times in the denominator there. So we can factor this in a particular way. We can write this as 
2 by 2 pi, so 1 upon root 2 by 2 pi, e to the negative 1 half um, times 1 over 2 u squared, all of that by, again, 1 upon 2 by 2 pi, e to the negative 1 half times 1 half b squared. All right, so that's equivalent. I'm just factoring it out. And what this says is that this is f is the marginal of u, and this is the marginal of v. Why do I know that? Well, effectively, I can factor it into a sum function, whether or not it be the marginal. Um, we don't really care. I can factor the sum function of u and sum function of v. That means, by definition of independence, or by our theorem of independence, that u is independent of v. And furthermore, I've chosen the factor in here so that both of these fu and fv integrate to 1, so they are indeed the PMFs, or the PDFs, the marginal PDFs. And if we scrutinize these marginal PDFs, we see that the first PDF here is a normal 0, 2, and the second one is also a normal 0, 2. And so what this means is that u is distributed normal 0, 2, and v is also distributed normal 0, 2. So to recap what we've shown in this problem is we assumed x and y were i, i, d, normal 0, 1, and we showed that u, which is x plus y, and v, which is x minus y, those are also independent, and they're identically distributed now with a normal 0, 2 distribution. And that makes some sense. For example, if we recall, if x is normal 0, 1, and y is normal 0, 1, and x is independent of y, then x plus y should be normal 0, 2. I add, just add the mean and add the variances. And so this comports with what we find here, which is that x plus y and indeed x minus y are normal 0, 2. The more general fact, we can call it a theorem, although we're not going to go through the proof. The proof is essentially this problem, is that if we have x and y, and they're independent of each other, and x is a normal mu sigma squared, and y is a normal, oh, let's say lambda tau squared, then x plus or minus y are independent. So x plus y, that's supposed to be really independent, x plus y and x minus y are independent, and x plus or minus y is distributed mu plus or minus lambda, and then we add the variances. We've seen various versions of this before. So that's kind of the more general fact. And of course, you can do this with other distributions given our example, but with a normal, it comes out to be really nice. Okay. Before we go into some other examples, I want to make a real quick comment about um, independence. And so here's a, a useful theorem. Independence um, and transformations. And the theorem says that if I have two random variables, x and a, and a y, and they're independent, and g and h are two functions. Um, so g is a real valued function, and so is h. h is a real valued function. Then if I look at u, which is g of x, and v, which is h of y, then since each of these functions, u, since u only involves x and v only involves y, so u is some function of x, v is some function of y, u and v are also independent. So the idea is that 
um, in the, uh, is that um, functions of independent, um, let's say random variables are also independent. And what I mean by that is if I just have a function of just x and just a function of just y and x and y are independent, then so are uh, the functions of them. So the example, here's an example. If u is x squared and v is negative log y, if x is independent of y, then so is, so, um, then we can say u is independent of v. Very nice little theorem. I don't, in those cases, don't have to check independence. I just get independence. Um, we can actually do a little proof of this. So let's do a proof. Um, and this is a nice little use of our um, definition of independence here. And uh, so the proof, um, if we uh, look at this, says something. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to say, if I look at the joint CDF of U and V, so I've done my transformations. So F sub, at capital F, the CDF sub U, V, and remember it's the random variables U and V, and I plug it in two values, little U and little V, right? Our definition of the joint CDF, this is the problem is U, is, probability U is less than little U, and V is less than or equal to little V. And we have a definition that u is g of x and v is uh, h of y. I can rewrite this probability, probability that u is less than little u and v is less than little v. I can write this in terms of, of um, x and y by saying this is the probability x is in the inverse image of um, inverse image of, say, negative infinity to little u, and y is in the inverse image under h of negative infinity to little v. And um, because x is independent of y, we can continue on and we can actually break this thing up. Our definition of independence says that if x is independent of y, we can just break this into two probabilities. It's a bit cumbersome, but I can do this. And this is probably y is in the inverse image of h, negative infinity to y. Um, I guess I should have a closed, uh, closed interval in the end here, right? This should be a closed interval. Okay. Doesn't really matter. And so I can break it up into probabilities like that, and I can just actually reverse my inverse image here and say this is the probability that g of x less than or equal to u times the probability that h of y less than or equal to the y or, oops, I'm sorry, shouldn't be y here, it should be a b, should be a b, and g of x is u, and h of y is v, and these are the definition of the marginals. So this is the marginal CDF of u times the marginal CDF of v, and what I showed is that the product of the marginal CDFs follow my chain all the way back up, is the joint CDF. And so, by definition, or by our theorem, it says that you must be independent of V. So it's actually not too bad of a theorem to follow along. Um, it's mostly just notation and using the definitions of, um, of these things. Okay, let's get back to some more examples of bivariate transformations, because that's a, a really useful thing we can do um, today. So let us look at an example. Let x be distributed beta 
alpha beta and y be distributed beta alpha plus beta gamma. So there's two parameters to a beta distribution, typically alpha beta, but so I could say x is alpha beta is beta with parameters alpha beta and y, I suppose I should write beta here, shouldn't I? Beta alpha plus beta gamma. So we have just a different parameter for the second and the param first parameter is the sum of the parameter for the other ones. And to make our lives a little easier, let's say x is independent of y. Now the question that you might want to ask is, for example, what is the distribution of x times y? So beta distributions have a support between 0 and 1. So x is between 0 and 1, y is between 0 and 1. If I multiply them, presumably x times y should be a number between 0 and 1. Does it have a beta distribution? It doesn't have to. It could have some other distribution distributed between 0 and 1. And the way we're going to answer this, and we're going to see this as going to be a useful tool, is we're actually going to do a bivariate transformation where one of the two transformations is the one we're interested in, and then we're going to marginalize out that transformation to get its univariate distribution. So you can just keep in the back of your mind, the question is, you could ask the question of what's the distribution of x times y. So the way we're going to solve this, it seems like it's a much more complicated way to solve this than necessary, but it's actually the kind of classic way of solving this problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a bivariate transformation, u, which is x times y, what we're actually interested in. And we're going to choose v to be something else that won't cause too much trouble. I'm going to say v is x. So that's my bivariate transformation. Notice here that um, we have a relationship that both u and v are between 0 and 1, and u is always less than v, right? So beta distributed random variables, which are both of these, are numbers between 0 and 1. And so if I take x and multiply by y, which is a number between 0 and 1, because x is also between 0 and 1, that will be smaller than x. So u, which is the product of two numbers between 0 and 1, is smaller than just one of them. And that kind of always has to be true. So we've got to keep in mind that there's a relationship between u and v. And so what we're going to do is we're going to find the joint distribution of u and v, and then we're going to marginalize out v. We're going to get just the marginal distribution of u, and that will give us the distribution of x times y, which is the question we really want to answer. So let's look at how to do this. So here's our transformation. u is xy and v is x. So we need the inverse transformation. How do I go from uv to xy? Well, this is just kind of solving a little system of, of equations, right? Certainly, x is v. So that's one of the inverse. If I know xy, I'm sorry, if I know uv, I can get x back by just saying, well, it's v, okay? And if I look at u over v, that will give me y because I'm just going to basically divide through by x. So this actually gives us our inverse transformations. g1 inverse of uv is just v. So x is um, just v. And if I want to get y back, but I know u and v, I can look at the inverse g2 inverse, which is u over v. So this is the inverse transformation. And our theorem, the way we apply the theorem is we need to get um, the Jacobian determinant, right? So that's that's the thing to get. So what we want to get is we want to get um, J, which I'll call absolute value of, we look at the derivative of the inverse function with respect to U and V. So this is the Jacobian, we're going to call this J, Jacobian determinant. So, um, I had to write this. Let's be more careful here. Absolute value determinant of this thing. There we go. That's a little, little, little better here. Okay. 
So DG inverse with respect to U and V is the matrix. DG1 inverse DU, DG1 inverse DV, DG2 inverse DU, DG2 inverse DV. And so let's calculate these partial derivatives. G1 is just V. Derivative with respect to U is 0. With respect to V is 1. G2 is U over V. With respect to U, it gives me 1 over V. And with respect to V, it gives me negative U over V squared. And so if I look at J, which is absolute value determinant of that matrix, this is absolute value. The determinant is 0 by negative u over v squared minus 1 over v times 1. So all together, we just get 1 over v. To get now what we want, which is the joint distribution of u and v, du v, uh, little u, little v, what I do is I take fx comma y, I plug in g uh, 1 inverse of u, v, g, 2 inverse of u, comma, v, and I multiply by j, my Jacobian determinant. So we need to get what f, x, y is, and we said that x and y are independent, and they have certain beta distributions. So f, x, y at, um, let's just say x, comma, y for now, since they're independent, we can factor this as fx times fy. And so this comes from the fact that we assume that x is independent of y. And we also said x has some beta distribution, alpha beta. Oh, let me write this better. x distributed beta, alpha beta, and y distributed beta alpha plus beta gamma. So the beta distribution, beta alpha beta, which is the, the classic one, is just x to the alpha minus 1. So we're going to write fx first. 1 minus x to the beta minus 1. And then we divide through by this constant beta alpha beta. y, the first parameter is now alpha plus beta. So it's alpha plus beta minus 1. 1 minus y. And the second parameter is gamma. And now we divide through by the beta function, alpha plus beta, gamma. So you can go back and look at what your beta PDF is. That's following the rules for the beta PDF. And so now we want to get f of u and v at little u, little v. And so we're going to take f, x, y. We're going to plug in g1 inverse, which is v and g2 inverse, which is u over v. So you can look above, that's what that was. And then we multiply by Jacobian determinant is 1 over v. Okay, so now let us now expand out, given that this is fx comma y, we're going to plug in for x v and for y u over v. So plugging in x for, uh, v in, in place of x is easy. It's v to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus v to the beta minus 1, beta alpha beta. And now we plug in u over v instead of y, minus u over v, gamma minus 1. And then we get the constant in the bottom there. So we're, I'm going to make us do a simplification step. This may not look like a simplification step, but I'm going to make a claim that we can do this, that this is equivalent. It's just writing it differently. So first of all, I'm going to pull out my constants, beta alpha beta and beta of alpha plus beta gamma. So that no one's going to argue with. And you can check the algebra. I'm not going to sit and do all the algebra for you, but 
this can be written as u to the alpha minus 1, u over v minus u to the beta minus 1, times 1 minus u over v to the gamma minus 1, times u over v squared. we got to remember up here there's a 1 over v, right? That thing. So that comes out there. Right? So don't forget that. I'll let you sit and think about that, about why that's correct. That is an equivalent way of writing this, and they've just simplified it um, for our purposes in a couple ways. So again, you could stop here. This would be the valid, this is the joint, joint PD, uh, PDF. Oops. So this thing here is a joint PDF of U comma V. But really, what we wanted was we wanted the marginal distribution of u. What we want is the marginal, that is, the distribution of u, which is x times y. That's the question we started off with. And I said what we can do is we can find the joint of u and something that won't hurt too much. And so we define v to be something very simple. And then we're just going to basically marginalize out v in this case. Right? We can get the marginal of u by saying, ah, let's take the, marg the joint of u v and integrate with that with respect to v. That will give us the marginal of u, and that will give us the distribution of x times y. So if you believe this algebra step here, then when I do this integral, so I'm now going to sit and do this integral, what we get is so f u of u, we're going to integrate f u v u comma v with respect to v. Now recall from above we have this relationship. Zero less than u less than v less than one. So when I do this integral with respect to v, v goes u to one. Not 0 to 1, u to 1. It's just a relationship between u and v. And I have this joint PDF here. So all of my things that don't depend on v can come out. That's my constants, beta alpha beta, beta alpha plus beta gamma. And I get a u the alpha minus 1, and then we get an integral from u to 1, and I'm left with u over v minus u, the beta minus 1, 1 minus u over v, the gamma minus 1, and I have a u over v squared dv. And again, you should, you should sit, you should pause this, sit, convince yourself that this is equivalent to what we had here. It's just some algebra. Okay, so now we have to solve this integral. And what I'm gonna, gonna say is, and this is very useful, is that this looks like a beta. Why do I say that? Beta distribution is like one, it's like one, uh, beta distribution looks like x to the alpha minus something times one minus x to the beta. So it looks like x times 1 minus x. And um, I'm going to convert this into a beta. So I'm going to basically um, make this into a form of something to a power times 1 minus that thing to another power. And the way I'm going to do that is, um, is I'm basically going to let that be my new variable. So specifically what I'm going to do is I'm going to define y. This is no relation to the original y. This is just um, a dummy variable here by integral. I can say this is u over v minus u. And then I'm going to multiply by 1 over 1 minus u. Equivalently, so equivalently, this says y by 1 minus u is u over v minus u. And that's this thing in the center row. 
So I'll eventually place that second interval with with y times one minus u. Other things I can notice is that. So let's say also. If I could do a rearrangement of this, and just a line here, I could show that one minus u over v, the second thing, is one minus y times one minus u. So you can derive that from this definition. If um, I take one minus um, one minus y should be one minus u over v minus u times one over one minus u, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by one minus u, one minus u minus u over v minus u. Which is, when I do that, this u cancels with that one. Okay, as I claimed. So the two facts I'm going to keep in mind are this one y by 1 minus u is u over v minus u, and 1 minus y by 1 minus u is 1 minus u over v, which are these two components in this thing, in this integral I need to solve. If I define y as I do in this box, I can eventually want to do a change of variables. In this case, dy will be negative u over v squared by 1 minus u. Okay. If I take the derivative of, of this uh, dy d, dv, it will give me this. So dy is negative u over v squared 1 minus u. That's the last part I need. So all, right, all these box facts plug into my integral. So these are a bunch of tricks. So this is just an example. I'm not going to expect you to, to, to do this complicated example on an exam. But if I bring down my integral, so this was my integral here. I'm going to bring this thing down. Just continue this here. What did I have? I had a beta, alpha, beta, beta, alpha plus beta, gamma. I had a u to the alpha minus 1. And I'm going to make the change of variables where I'm going to substitute in y now. So u, so let's just write some things given my definitions u over v minus u is y by 1 minus u. So this thing is y by 1 minus u, and this thing here is 1 minus y by 1 minus u. So it's y by 1 minus u to the beta minus 1. And 1 minus y times 1 minus u to the, well, we have gamma minus 1. And u over v squared dv is u over v squared oops, dv. Solving this is negative. 1 minus u dy. And so let me just bring this all to the left here. This is negative 1 minus u dy. And I have my integral. The limits of my integral go from 1 to 0. So if you look when I plug in u on the bottom and then 1 on top into this thing, I get 1 on the bottom and 0 on top. Or I could flip these. I could say it's 0 to 1, and I could get rid of that minus sign. Okay. So 
again. Almost done. I have a u to the alpha minus 1, and this thing is an integral with respect to dy. All the u's can come out. How many u's do I have? I have beta minus 1 of them, plus gamma minus 1, plus 1. So I get 1 minus u to the beta plus gamma minus 1. It should be beta, minus, beta plus gamma minus 2 plus 1. And then I get an integral of 0 to 1. And all I'm left with is a y, a 1 minus y, a dy, y to the power of beta minus 1, dy, uh, 1 minus y to the power of gamma minus 1. And this, basically, is a beta beta gamma. So that's the whole trick I've done. I converted this into the um, basically the PDF of that. And so it will integrate to 1. It will integrate to 1 if I divide through by the correct constant. So if I divide through by beta of beta gamma, and I multiply by beta of beta gamma, this whole thing is now 1. And so what I'm left with is u to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus u to the beta plus gamma minus 1. And all of my other constants, if you expand out your definitions and you, um, and you simplify, those can all be simplified as beta of beta plus gamma. And so this is a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta plus gamma. So u is distributed beta, alpha, beta plus gamma. And that is the question we want, because u in this case was x by y. So that's a pretty involved example. But it shows you that how, if you say go on Wikipedia, you look up the beta distribution, they have a list of facts. And one of the facts is if I have certain betas and I multiply them, I'll get another type of beta. It's done with a bivariate transformation, and this is how it's done. Now, that's a pretty involved example, um, but that's how that fact is derived. And there are a couple tricks here I don't expect you to memorize, but I expect you to kind of know how to get, you know, the process of you get the, the, you do the bivariate transformation, you get the bivariate PDF, and then you marginalize out one of them. So we'll see a, another, um, at least one more example. Okay, so this, this, this bivariate transformation stuff is probably some of the more difficult stuff in this course. So if it seems complicated, it, it's a bit complicated. So in the univariate case, we had a case where what if our transformation was not monotone? Now we don't talk about monotonicity in the bivariate case because there's no real kind of definition of monotonicity for two variable functions. We talk about invertibility. We need the function to be invertible. And so we can, in the univariate case, we, if it weren't invertible as, or monotone, as long as it we could break, break it into chunks that were monotone, we were okay. And same thing in the bivariate case. So non, in the case um, we had from our theorem was that we needed this bivariate transformation to be invertible. Now invertibility is well defined for a two variable function. But we could have a function that's not invertible. And the theorem basically says, as long as we can break my transformation g into chunks that are invertible, we're OK. So if a is the support now of the bivariate random variable x comma y, that this is some subset of R2, where the bivariate PDF is positive, and A is partitioned into some chunks A1 to A capital K, 
And if I have u, um, comma v, is some function of x, y, some function g of x, y, so that while g may not be invertible, so this thing not be invertible, but I can on each of the chunks, let's write it like this, g k um, of x comma y on a k. So if I can break up g into a series of functions, series of capital K functions such that on a sub k, on my little chunk, u comma v is this little chunk of this function, g superscript k of x and y. And all of these g sub k are invertible. Then we get basically what we had last time, where if I want the bivariate PDF of u v, I'm just going to sum over my chunks. I'm going to sum, and what am I going to sum? I'm going to plug each of these chunks into the PDF of x, y, and I'm going to I'll write it like this. So g, k, ooh, my notation's going to be ugly, g, k inverse of u, comma, v. Um, and I will multiply by the absolute value of the determinant of the derivative of or the Jacobian of g, k inverse with respect to u and v. Okay, so the determinant of this Jacobian matrix. And this is, um, it's a real cumbersome theorem to write out, but it's, it's, it's not too bad, actually. Um, this is pretty much just the generalization of what we saw last time, where um, now we have bivariate function we're summing. Okay. Example. Because that theorem is quite complicated to state, but it's actually not too bad. So here's another example where what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at x and y. I'm going to say again that they're iid normal 0, 1. So they're both normal 0, 1, and they're independent. And what I really would want to do is I want to ask, well, what is the distribution of the ratio of two independent normals? And so I'm going to define that to be u. And the way I'm going to get it is I'm going to define something else. And then I'm going to get them called b. I'm going to get the bivariate transformation, bivariate PDF of, of u comma b. And then I'm going to integrate out v. And I'll be left with just u, and that will give me the distribution of what I really want, which is u, in this case, the ratio of two independent normals. In this case, I'm going to define v to be absolute value of y. So this function is not invertible on the whole real plane, uh, or real plane, the whole plane of R2, right? So if I look at R2, what I'm going to do is if I chunk this up into an A1 where y is bigger than 0 and some A2 where y is less than 0, my claim, and you can think about why this is true, is that on these two sets, I can I have an invertible transformation. So if I give you x, y, not only can you get u, v, but if I give you u and v, I can uniquely get back to x and y. That's what it means for invertible transformation. So to apply my theorem, so as an example, if I didn't do this, if I observe some value of v, I wouldn't know if it's y or negative y. Okay. So to apply this, I'm going to work with these two chunks and um, and I'm going to add them together at the end. So first, I'm going to look at a1. Okay. So u is x over y, and v is y. And so, and furthermore, I'm, uh, v is y. You could say it's absolute value of y, 
Um, in fact, I probably should say it's absolute value of y. Um, in this case, so on a1, I must just talk, a1 is the set of all x and y such that y is bigger than 0, right? So um, in this case, how do I go back? Um, how do I invert this transformation? Um, well, let's look ahead and do this. Um, what do I know? I know that x is u times y. Or I can write it like this. So if I have little u is x over y, then x is uy. And um, if y is bigger than 0, for y bigger than 0, absolute value of y is just y. Okay, so that's why I was fiddling with that before, right? And that is equal to, so v is absolute value of y is y. That gives us one of the inverse transformations. Right? If I want to get y, just whatever my v is. And if I want to um, get x, now I know that y is just v, so this is u times v. So that gives me the other, that gives me x. So my inverse transformation, so I first go x, y goes to x over y, y, or I could go u, v to v, uh, or to u times v and v. That's the inverse transformation. So g, let's put a superscript 1 because we're on a1, sub 1. So this is the component function that gives me back x is just u, v, and we got that from there, and g2, superscript 1 because we're on a1 of u comma v, is the component function that gives me back y, which we know is just the second component because y is bigger than 0. <clears throat> um, I guess we should add our little inverses because these are the inverse functions. Thus, if we look at this thing, the Jacobian matrix, that we're just going to take, there's a lot more notation than, than um, is often good for one, right? So it's actually not that bad, right? You find the inverse thing, and then you take the derivatives with respect to u and v. So derivative of the first one with respect to the u is v, with respect to v is u. Derivative of the second one with respect to u is 0, with respect to v is 1. And so j, which I'm going to call absolute value of determinant of that thing, is just v. Okay. So the summary from this is that is, let's just do this in red, the two component inverses are u, v, and u, or u, v, and v, and the Jacobian determinant is just v. Um, okay. Let's now look at a2. So on a2, this is where y is less than 0, so abs y is negative y. And I'm going to go through this real quick. We can show, I'm not going to go through all the details, is that g2 inverse, g1, 2 inverse of uv, so the first component inverse of the second set, a2, is going to be negative uv, g, second component inverse of the second set, is negative v. We're just getting negative signs, right? Basically from that fact. And um, I'm not going to belabor this. The Jacobian determinant is that uh, also v. Why is it not negative v? Well, we look at the absolute value 
of the determinant. So it's actually just b in this case. So let's put this all together. Okay, all together. We're going to have to add some things. All together. F, so I'm going to write this out once. This is going to be awful, but okay, I'm going to write this out. FUV is FXY of G1, 1 inverse of UV, G2, 1 inverse of UV times, uh, we can call the first one, well, it doesn't really matter, times J. The two Jacobian determinants are the same, right? So it's times J1. Um, if we call this one J2 and the first one, um, whoops, and the first one J1, doesn't, in this case, it doesn't matter because it's the same. And then we also add on the second opponent, Fxy of G now 2, 1 inverse of UV, G2, 2 inverse of UV. All right, it's a bit cumbersome, and then we multiply by J2. Luckily, these things are not too bad. So this thing here is uv, this thing here is v, this one, this first component is negative uv, and this thing is negative v, and j1 and j2 are just v. So recall that x comma y is iid, standard normal, normal zero, one. And so fxy, this thing, follows a kind of simple, simple, pretty simple formula. Um, let's just, as an aside here, write this out. It's fx comma y of xy um, is one over two pi e to the negative one half x squared e to the negative one half y squared, right? That's what a bivariate normal looks like with independent components, um, okay? And so we can combine that. And so we're just plugging in. It, this will give us, so let's continue in black here. Let's say this thing, right? We continue on here. We get a one over two pi. We get an e to the negative one half. Um, and, uh, quickly do this. It's uv squared plus v squared, right? So we have fxy twice. We have fxy here, and then we have fxy here, right? So I've just com combined their exponents. Um, you could do that. You could rewrite this as um, x squared plus y squared like that. That's all I'm doing there. And um, then we multiply by the Jacobian determinant as v. We add on, and then we have our fxy again which is negative one half, and we have negative uv squared plus negative v squared, which is cute because the values go away when you square things. And all together, what we get is we get v over pi. We just get twice the first one, so two times that, um, which is v over pi, e exponent of negative one half, um, and I'm going to write this as v squared times 1 plus u squared. So this is my joint of u and v. Okay, so that's one of the big steps. What I really wanted was I wanted the marginal of, of u, which is the ratio of two standard normals. And so the way I get that is I integrate out v, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little substitution. I'm going to call beta 1 plus u squared um, so that if I look at, if I want my marginal of u, what I do is I take um, the joint fuv and I integrate out v. Now v is, if we recall, v is absolute value of a normal. 
so it ranges from zero to infinity. And if I make um, substitution of beta as one plus u squared, what I get is I get um, v pi um, and I get e to the negative one half um, beta d squared dv. And then I'm going to make a change of variables because this is v e to the b squared. But this is a very simple substitution problem. If I let z be v squared, dz is 2v um, dv. And so my integral, I can write as an integral of z. I'm going to pull out everything that doesn't depend on v. So I've got a 1 over pi. Um, and I integrate. My limits are still 0 to infinity. And it's the integral of e to the negative. Um, you know what? Let's make this make this 1 half v squared, then that 2 goes away. Aha! Now that's a clever trick. And so I get beta times z. I get a dz. And if I multiply by 1 over beta times beta, this is the integral of a um, exponential distribution with parameter beta. So it's 1. And so what I get at the end of the day is just 1 over pi by 1 over beta. But of course, 1 over beta was, or beta was 1 plus u squared. So I get 1 over pi times 1 over u squared. So this was my marginal with respect to u, so f u of u. Okay? That's my marginal. And u, remember, was the ratio of two standard normals. This, if you remember, there's no particular reason, is a Cauchy random variable. We saw this one because Cauchy random variables have no expectation. They have no expected value that exists. And so they're kind of a weird counterexample, but they can show up. And in fact, if you take the ratio of two standard normals, you get a Cauchy. Okay. So we're going to do one more example of a bivariate transformation. Um, and uh, we've seen now twice so far, we've seen how when I want to get some function of two random variables and find its distribution, I can often use a bivariate transformation and then marginalize out anything I don't care about. Our last example is actually one of the easier examples. So we're going to end nice and easy here. We're going to look at two random variables. Um, and they're both going to be gamma. One is going to be gamma alpha lambda, and a y, which is going to be gamma beta lambda. And we're going to specify that x and y are independent of each other. And we're going to look at u, which is x plus y, and v, which is x over x plus y. Okay. And then this one actually getting both the marginals is going to be really kind of straightforward. So let's get the joint distribution of u and v. Notice that, um, so u x plus y, and v is x over u, so x is uv, okay, that's one of the inverses, and if x is uv, then if I look at u minus x, that should give me y, right, 
And so that's u minus uv. Um, that gives me y. That's my second inverse. So my first inverse, g1 inverse, which gives me back x, is uv. And g2 inverse, which gives me back y, is u minus uv. So to get my Jacobian matrix, um, so a derivative of this thing with respect to u and v, so the process hopefully is becoming somewhat familiar. I just take the derivative of these two components, derivative with respect to u, a derivative of u v with respect to u is v and u, derivative of respect to u minus u v with respect to u is one minus v, and with respect to v is just negative u. And so j, which is absolute value of the determinant of derivative or this Jacobian function, is abs of negative u v minus u one minus v just gives me u. So that's kind of nice. Um, so the Jacobian determinant is, is pretty straightforward. Now, um, in this case, we had looked at, um, we said x had some gamma alpha lambda and y had some gamma. Um, and in this case, what was it? It was beta lambda, right? And they're independent of each other. It's independent of y. So we need, of course, the joint of x and y, which is easy because it's just the PDF of x times the PDF of y. And the only reason we know that is because they're independent. So we just multiply them. And so we have to remember the beta, or I'm sorry, the gamma PDFs. Um, for a gamma alpha lambda, it's lambda to the alpha um, x to the alpha minus 1 e to the negative lambda x over gamma of alpha. And then we multiply by gamma beta lambda, which is, whoops, lambda to the beta y now to the beta minus 1 e to the negative lambda y over gamma of beta. Okay. And so all together, because now we have all the components, f of u comma v of u v. And so we plug in um, fx comma y of our two inverses. Our inverses were u v and u minus u v. And our Jacobian determinant was just u. And so we plug this in, we have f of x, y here, the joint PDF of x and y. And so we're just going to plug in. And um, let's plug in lambda to the alpha, u, v to the alpha minus 1, e to the negative lambda, u, v, gamma alpha, lambda to the beta, u minus u, v, the beta minus 1 e to the negative lambda u minus uv gamma of beta. Okay. And um, I'm going to do a little real quick algebra. And you can check for this yourself that what I'm telling you is going to be true. So for instance, I could distribute this power over both u and v. I could factor a u out of that one. So this is a couple things I can do. And if I simplify this, first of all, it's lambda um, to the alpha plus beta. Um, in combining my two powers of lambda, I'm going to get a u. It's going to have a power of alpha and plus beta um, minus 1. Don't forget my Jacobi determinant, u on the back, 
So that is just a minus one, not a minus two. I have e to the negative um, lambda u. So you have to combine the powers of here. So e to the negative lambda u minus minus e to the negative lambda u. So those e to the negative lambda u's cancel. That leaves me with just an e to the negative lambda, or sorry, e to the negative lambda u v cancels. It leaves me just with e to the negative lambda u. Just some algebra. And what else am I left with? I'm left with a v to the power alpha minus one. That comes from this, or rather, whoops, rather this side of it, right? And I am left with a one minus v to the beta minus one. And then this is all over gamma of alpha, gamma of beta. So check the algebra, sit and think about it. I've just basically done some algebra to simplify things. And normally, so this is the joint PDF of u and v. Normally to get the marginals, I'd have to do a bunch of integration. If I look at just what we call the kernels, which is just the parts involving the variables, I don't care about constants, I get these two things, u to the alpha plus beta minus one, e to the negative lambda u. This looks like, or is proportional to, the PDF of a gamma alpha plus beta lambda. So the part involving u is proportional to the PDF of that, and the part involving v is proportional to uh, beta alpha beta PDF, okay? That means, and, and moreover, I can separate out the variables to just some function involving u times just some function involving um, v. So this is like um, some h1 of u times some h2 of v, where these are just some functions, u of v. And there are some constants, but we don't really care about the constants. But this h1 function is basically the important part of a gamma, and the h2 function is basically the important part of a beta. And that tells me that marginally, u, x plus y, must have a gamma alpha plus beta lambda distribution, and v, which is x over x plus y, marginally must have a beta alpha beta distribution. Why, why do I, why can I say that? Because if I can factor these, moreover, they're, whoops, u and v are independent of each other, right? I can factor the joint PDF as a function of u times some function of v. So u and v better be, are totally independent of each other. And when I can do that factorization, the functions in that factorization are up to a constant, the marginal PDFs. And you can do the integration if you want to prove it to yourself. It's a cute little theorem you can prove. And so I don't really have to care about the constants. All I have to do is look at the parts that kind of involve the variables u and v. They're independent of each other because I can factor the joint PDF. And because they're proportional to respectively a gamma and a beta, they have those distributions marginally. So we'll stop there. We've got a bunch of examples of, um, of uh, bivariate transformations. Um, and they can be very complicated and involved. Uh, you know, uh, the homework um, will not be as quite as involved, but it gives you a, a good overview of all the power um, of these bivariate transformations. And, you know, when you look up and look at, okay, what if I add two of these variables to this variable and this variable, and you see all these tables of people who've worked out these properties, this is one of the major tools that's used to work out these properties. Um, so um, we'll stop there. Um, and next time we'll start 
talking about multivariable um, random variables.